Hello and welcome to The Sacred. I am your host, Elizabeth Oldfield, and this is a podcast in which we try and go a bit more personal than your standard ideas podcast, though you should still learn a lot. Our hope is to get to the people, the complicated, multifaceted human beings behind the positions in our public conversations by starting off with an enormous question about what they hold sacred, what are their deepest values, what are they trying to live for. Our guests come from a wide range of backgrounds, perspectives and professions, and you should hear before long someone quite different from yourself. In an age when it's easy to only listen to people like us, or who we already like, or even people we already sense like people like us, that's a lot of likes, you know what I mean, all the while seething at those idiots over there and letting ourselves often be formed into very them and us in and out group thinking. We believe in the quiet magic of listening with curiosity and openness. I have found it just very enriching and I have grown loads by seeking out voices that I wouldn't necessarily come across or people I don't already know, or even people whom I instinctively not want to listen to or particularly not want to talk to. I am reminded again and again that everyone is more interesting than they first appear. As always, please rate and review the podcast. It really does warm my heart. It helps with the algorithms and My favourite thing is when someone lets me know that you've used an episode to open up a conversation with a friend. Um, So please do get in touch either via our email address or via Twitter, all of which is available in the show notes. In this episode, you'll hear a conversation I had with Mina Salami. Mina is a social critic, feminist theorist and poet, and she's founder of the blog Miss Afropolitan. She's the author most recently of Sensuous Knowledge, a black feminist approach for everyone. We spoke about her childhood in Nigeria and Finland, her experiences with racism, her deep feminist identity, and what a more holistic approach to knowledge might look like. I really hope you enjoy listening. Mina, I am going to ask you what is sacred to you. It's not every day on the bus kind of question that we get asked. So the hope is that it helps uh, uh, dust off bits of our thinking that we might not have a chance to use all the time. But people have different reactions to the word sacred, uh, positive and negative. So firstly, kind of how did the question sit with you? How did it feel? I loved it. Um, I, 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 okay. I love to think about what is sacred to me. I think, you know, especially in times where there is so much, our attention is so fleeting and there's so much consumerism and, you know, just, just feeling like you're all over the place quite easily in our times. Um, the, the notion of the sacred instantly brings you to a more still place. For me, the word is a poetic word before it is a religious one or a spiritual one, um, perhaps because of that stillness that it evokes. When I read poetry, it's something that always uh, makes me still. It brings me into the present moment very starkly. Um, And so the word sacred, doing that makes me associated with the poetic. Beautiful. So uh, tell me what bubbles up for you about what is sacred to you, principles or values that you have at least tried to hold to in your life. Well, I have a motto in my life that um, I can't quite remember when I started to to use it as a kind of lodestar. But um, it is actually going back to poetry. So it's uh, it's a riff on the poem Conscientious Objector by Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, and she says in that poem, uh, I will die, but that is all that I will do for death. Um, and it's a line that I find so beautiful and powerful. And I guess at some point when I was reading that poem, um, this, this phrase came to my mind, which is, I will live, but that is all that I will do for patriarchy. Um, and I mentioned that because I guess what is sacred to me is living a feminist life, um, which I can share more about later, um, but living a life which, in which there is an integrity with the values uh, that I uphold and in which I am committed to not complying with the oppression of women 
uh, that happens in patriarchy. So, so that's a kind of that motto is is sacred to me. Actually, it's something that uh, you know it so neatly expresses the things that I I, I hold valuable. There's something there about integrity, and I guess the the title of the poem, conscientious objection, this this sort of refusal um, of a system that you don't believe in. Yeah, consistently, consistently, and I I th- I, th- I think also. Um, Another way to think about it, it goes back to another one of our feminist foremothers, Virginia Woolf, and and where she describes uh, the need for women to have a room of one's own. Um, She was speaking about that uh, both in terms of space and in terms of economy. Um, So to to, to pursue uh, having enough of a financial situation in which you can create space for yourself to think um, and to think as a woman. I'm trying to kind of develop the habit of asking how these sacred values have shaped your life decisions. Can you think of an example of that? Maybe you've been at a fork in the road, your life could have gone one way or another, and, and that principle has guided you. Certainly, um, it has meant that I've had to make choices that, I, that sometimes required um, my breaking from convention. Um, in fact, quite often, I would say that, you know, one, one way I could uh, speak about my life is that I've uh, very much defied what it was meant to be. Um, but to, to give a concrete example, um, I was working um, for many years uh, in the marketing industries. I had a successful career. I'd worked in Sweden, in New York, and then in London. I, I didn't have the motto that I've shared with you about not living uh, for patriarchy at the time yet, but I was a feminist and I was already sort of in pursuit of living a feminist life. And there were so many things about that kind of lifestyle that clashed with those values. Um, I'm not saying that working in, in, you know, in the corporate world or in the creative industries as I did is necessarily unfeminist. Um, but for me, the kind of the corporate culture, the, the, the constantly working over hours and um, working in organizations which were typically led by men um, and led in very particularly masculine ways, um, just felt like I can't do this without crushing my soul. Um, and so I quite uh, spontaneously decided that I was going to, to quit my job um, Actually, uh, during a, a, a kind of heated conversation with my boss at the time, in which I felt like I was being treated in sexist ways. Um, and uh, I guess I'd been mulling about it over a period of time, but I hadn't made any kind of conclusive decision. And then I, uh, I, I spontaneously quit. And that was one very defining moment for me. Before we pick up those really interesting threads, I want to just wind back to the start and get a sense of where you've come from, the soil, uh, the plant, the beautiful bush or tree that is Mean Islami grew in. Um, could, particularly, were there any formative ideas around in your childhood, political, philosophical, religious, that you think are significant for who you are today? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I, I grew up in Lagos in Nigeria, um, which is a very cosmopolitan city. Um, There's about 15 million people who live in Lagos, probably more these days. Um, And, you know, it's people from all around the world, especially the African continent, but also importantly, um, Nigeria itself uh, is uh, an amalgamation of different uh, kingdoms and ethnicities uh, by the British during colonialism. So it was uh, Lagos being the capital city is one in w- to which everybody kind of migrates. Um, so that's the like the, the large framework of the environment that I grew up in. Um, within that, I then grew up in a what is called an uh, Igbe Ale, which is a traditional kind of family compound um, of the Yoruba ethnic group, which is where my uh, heritage comes from. Um, and what that means is that, you know, it's, it's different to the kind of Western nuclear family type of uh, abodes. Um, so it's a, it's a big house in which several kind of nuclear families live and share a lot of practices. So um, my parents and I lived there and then two of my aunties and their children and my grandmother lived with us intermittently. Um, there were you know, lots of workers, um, so a lot of people basically all of the time. Um, and, and this family compound was uh, an interfaith one. Even my own nuclear family was. My father's Muslim, my mother was Protestant. 
Um, my, my father is Nigerian. My mother is from Finland. Um, my parents met in Germany. And so they spoke as students and they spoke German to each other and to me. Um, but I would respond in Finnish to my mother and English to my father. Um, and, um, and yes, yeah, so I'm sharing all this to say that it was a, a household in which there were so many different perspectives around me. Um, and everybody was very religious, except for my mother. But I was, uh, from a very young age, I was encouraged to kind of decide for myself um, what I was going to believe in spiritually, philosophically. My parents were Pan-Africanists. My mother had a lot of feminist literature around. Unpack Pan-Africanist for me. So I'm sorry where I, I don't fully know the word. Yeah, so uh, Pan-Africanism is a socio-political movement that uh, gains a lot of strength during the struggles for independence um, in the 1960s. And so it's a it's the kind of coming together of different African nations, um, because African nations, as we know them today, uh, were colonial inventions. Um, and so it's the kind of belief in that the, the more united uh, we are as Africans, the stronger we will be able to resist colonialism. Um, and at the time when Pan-Africanism emerges, the, the African countries are still literally colonies. Um, Today, Pan-Africanism is still fighting uh, against neocolonialism and, you know, land grabbing and exploitation of, of different sorts. Um, and so that was a, a kind of key theme um, in my growing up. In, in our household, we always had people coming around, you know, and there was a lot of discussion, um, like activists and thinkers and also just, you know, family and friends. So this was in the 1980s. Um, and... Lagos and Nigeria more broadly at the time was indeed a, a real sort of, it was a neo-colonial state. So we gained independence in 1960. So it was just like 20 years old as an independent state. Mm -hmm. um, and it was also a very patriarchal um, culture, like everywhere in the world. But, you know, each culture has its own sort of ways of being patriarchal. Um, and so I had this kind of juxtaposition between um, the the conversations that were happening within my family, the structure of the family compound, um, which was very like African in a sense. Um, and then in the external world, um, there was this neo-colonial and patriarchal culture that was shaping my education and that I observed shaped society at large. Um, and I think that that kind of juxtaposition and that tension is something that has shaped my life Till this day, that's the kind of kernel for who I am um, and the things yeah. that I'm, I'm passionate about, but also the things that I'm resisting. Yeah, gosh, it couldn't help but be formative. This is a very personal question, but how did your mum's feminism find its place? How did she find her place in that kind of society? For my mom, who was uh, Finnish, um, moving to Nigeria was her way of non-conforming. <laughs> um, you know, uh, of course, there were things there that she found challenging, which are things I think she would have found challenging anywhere in the world, you know, just seeing any kind of in inequality. Um, but yeah, for her to uh, have left, uh, uh, she was from Tampere in Finland, um, a very small, narrow-minded, uh, you know, wonderful place that I feel a strong sense of belonging to, but a narrow-minded place with myopic views um, to be in a city of, you know, 15 million people from all around the world with a completely different worldviews um, was, was very much of a feminist uh, move on her part. Did you go back and forth between Lagos and Finland? Uh, so I... Grew up in Lagos until I was a teenager, but I we, mm -hmm. we did uh, visit Finland very frequently. So I have, uh, you know, like strong ties to Finland already from childhood. Um, but then I moved to Sweden to complicate things <laughs> further. My mother and I moved. Um, my dad stayed behind because he is so patriotic that I, he, I don't think he would entertain the thought of leaving Nigeria. Um, but my mother and I moved to Sweden temporarily because... Uh, there was a dictatorship in Nigeria 
And it was really bad. You know, there were riots all the time in my school, almost on a daily basis. There were attacks. Um, and so since we had the privilege of a Western passport, um, we decided, or my parents decided, that we would move to Sweden. I was very upset about it. Um, I was just at that age when you're, you know, everything is so exciting and I had great friends and I had a crush on someone and it was like, no, I don't want to go. Life is over. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, so I, I then um, spent 10 years in Sweden. So I, I, I've lived in Scandinavia uh, for almost as long as I lived in in Africa. So being Scandinavian African, um, that, that does feel quite precious in a sense um, that I've been able, I've been lucky to experience the two. Yeah, that must have been hard for your dad and, and you guys being apart. Yeah, it was very, very difficult. Um, my dad would come uh, and visit in Sweden as often as possible and vice versa. But because of the dictatorship and the political situation, which continued to worsen, it wasn't uh, the easiest thing. Um, and it was very difficult for me to adapt to Sweden. Um, the, I eventually, um, you know, I, I love Sweden. It's, it's home for me. Um, but the first two years were really difficult. Um, there was, I experienced a lot of racial prejudice. Um, I was bullied. I couldn't make friends. I didn't speak the language. So it was really, really challenging in that sense as well. So how much was that part of your identity as a Finnish Nigerian complex I guess while you were while you were living in Lagos and then obviously it really really became something that created hardship um when you were living in Sweden how, how did you navigate that how did you begin to be thinking about race was it already something very much on your mind or was it that kind of age 13 I gather you were beaten up you have know, racist racist attacks and then it's not something you can ignore yeah um yes it was in Sweden that I really started to think about um what it meant to be racialized in the world, what it meant to be black. Nigeria is the world's largest black nation. Um, it isn't a, a topic that is discussed in the way that it is in the, in the diaspora. Um, and so it wasn't until um, I was in Sweden and I was experience, experiencing uh, racial prejudice that I started to, to grapple with what that would mean. Um, I remember uh, coming across uh, one of my old journals from when I when I had just moved to Sweden. This was quite recent, a few years ago, and I, I found this old journal and I I was writing on a whole page. I'd written like aphorisms about blackness, things like, I love to be black, black is beautiful. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I could really tell that this was, you know, it took me back to that young Mina who was um, experiencing racism, but internally sort of, affirming uh, my blackness to myself. Um, I think that's like probably the kind of defining point at which I, I became black as a racial subject in the world. And do you remember a similar point where you became a feminist? Yeah, probably when I was born. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know how, how people uh, have their very earliest memories. It might be a color or a, a cartoon they watched or something. My earliest memories are, are my anger at the in, unjust treatment of girls. Um, wow. I remember being very small, maybe I'm, I don't know, three or something like that. Just feeling like, why are girls doing different things? Like, why, why are women expected to to behave differently. So yeah, my earliest um, memories are kind of feminist, but of course um, I didn't have that, that language then. The kind of first big moment where I'm more uh, a, a, of a conscientious, conscious being is when I was uh, 16 and I read a book called Sula by Toni Morrison. Um, and Sula is a book about a woman called Sula who's a kind of wayward woman. Um, living in the late 19th century. She's African-American um, and she's somebody who defies all norms. She's completely anti-conforming. She has several lovers. She refuses to get married or to have children um, despite all of society's pressure. And I read that book and I thought, this is me. <laughs> um, even though, you know, it's different ages, different kind of 
environment, but I related so much to that character. Um, so that for me is like my first feminist awakening. Um, but even then, I still didn't use the, the word. Um, and just because it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't mentioned in the book. Um, it wasn't a word that sort of was around me in a, in a pronounced way. Um, the first moment when I became a feminist explicitly was in university in Sweden. And um, it was actually uh, a Swedish man, my pr a professor, who was teaching a class in, in media studies. And uh, we watched Pretty Woman. Um, and he showed us excerpts from that. And he was telling us that this is the male gaze. He was describing that. And he said, this is something that feminists have been theorizing for years. And the moment he said that word, it was almost like, you know, he'd said that particular word with a loudspeaker or something. Um, and it just started to like bounce in my brain or something. And, um, and yeah, I couldn't wait for the lecture to be over. And I, I cycled to the library and asked the, the librarian to take me Tell to me the, all the books yeah, on feminism. Yeah, where are all the books on feminism? It was, um, it was amazing. It was really, I, and then I just spent, you know, weeks in that section and felt like, yes, I'm, I'm home. You know, this is me without a doubt. Yeah. I think we underrate that part of the world of ideas, right? That very often it's about a sense of belonging. It's a sense of the questions that we have of, about the world that we feel lonely because we have them. And then we find other people who have those same questions. And yeah, the, the, and we'll come to this, obviously, the role of, of emotion and the sense of being seen is such a big thing, I think. Um, we've met a little bit and I've really enjoyed getting to know you and, and reading about you before the thing I... I it's a real privilege, actually, this job, because it feels like you just get to have a little bit of a deep dive into a person. And yeah, there's a t that I always end up feeling incredibly tender towards <laughs> everyone that I interview. And the kind of specific tenderness with you is the sense of the, you've talked about the Weltschmerz, the kind of the pain of the world and your kind of unflinching commitment to calling out what's broken and calling out injustice and challenging systems where you see them causing oppression and people feeling invalidated and marginalized. It's a real that activist heart of like, no, I'm not just going to go along with this. I'm going to see clearly and speak clearly, which is where the power of your voice comes. But how do you, how do you build emotional resilience to keep doing that? What, what are the practices or habits or sources of wisdom that mean, I guess the burden of it doesn't destroy you almost is the honest question. <laughs> Um, that was very beautiful what you said about having tender moments to people that you speak to. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for bringing that uh, into this conversation as well. Um, so the thing is that, I guess, first of all, um, I don't necessarily uh, see myself as an activist, but I'm always very honored when somebody else calls me that. James Baldwin, um, he, he has uh, this incredible essay where he talks about um, the, the creative and the artist being somebody who is um, at war with society, at war with the world. Um, and that is the place in which you can create freely um, because you're not complying, you're not having to be agreeable or conformist. It's something that inspires me a lot that like uh, and informs uh, and resonated with me. Um, and I, I mention it because um, doing this work is a tremendous sense of joy. Like being feminist is such a pleasure. Um, I cannot, I, I, and because I know the life um, in which I wasn't yet living a feminist life, and I want to say that it's a process, like I'm still a, a work in, in progress, but, um, you know, be, because I know that life, whether it was when I was working in, in like in marketing or when I was a student or when I was in relationships that were unfeminist or when I didn't have the bravery to speak up if something was said around me that I disagreed with, um, I now can contrast the way that I now live, which is, yeah, like I see the oppression, I see the the ways in which people conform and contort themselves into shapes that are so disagreeable for them, especially women. Um, and from that place of seeing that and refusing to participate in it, it I mean, I cannot describe how, how much joy. It's a kind of 
uh, you know, maybe it's a kind of political joy, which which contains seeds of also, of course, of suffering and uh, pain and just frustration with how the world is. Um, but yeah, knowing knowing what an opposite the opposite kind of life where you're constantly making compromises um, is, then this for me is um, it's it's really the only way I can I can see myself living. That's yeah, that's very um, and inspiring and helpful perspective, and it helps me in that it kind of bridges to a conversation about feelings and feelings in our public conversations, feelings in those with a public voice, and particularly feelings in the world of ideas. I had another guest on the podcast with a series with Stuart Ritchie, who is a psychologist, does a lot of kind of public science communication. And he is very self-aware that his tone, even when he's talking about very serious things like COVID deaths or big public health things, uh, he sort of jokingly says, he sees it in Boris Johnson also, is very calm, unruffleable, and slightly jokey. And that that is very effective in those settings. And as he was saying that, I was like, oh, yeah, it is, damn it. Like, <laughs> because not everyone, that's not everyone's posture or temperament, and maybe nor should it be. And you've written about writer's grievance, which was a lovely phrase, this sense of like, I'm somehow... The way we do knowledge, the way we do status, the way we do power mandates that the people are taking seriously are almost the ones with no feelings <laughs> who can say very cool, calm, you know, witty, cheerful. Unpack your journey with that for me as a writer and someone with a public voice. So when you're writing, you, there's this notion of, of writer's block, which, which comes up frequently, uh, which is when a writer uh, just cannot write for days or months because... They, they're stuck um, for finding ideas. During my career, um, my journey as a writer, um, I have sometimes found myself in a similar kind of place. Um, so a place in which I feel very uh, unable to write. Um, I feel a kind of resistance to writing. Um, and I started to unpack that and, um, and I realized that it isn't writer's block that I feel because if anything, um, you know, touch wood, because <laughs> I'm not saying that that is not possible, but um, I've, I always feel like there's so many things that I want to write about. There's more things to write about than I have the time to write about. Um, but what was happening was that I would feel um, what I then call writer's grievance, which is I would become aware of uh, the kind of uh, almost howling rage <laughs> in my words, um, and and you know, as a I'm I am this person who is passionate about feminism and uh, black liberation and just social transformation at large, um, but I'm also a, a, a writer. Uh, I'm somebody who's very passionate about words, and there's a part of me which sees myself writing uh, just beautifully, you know, just creatively. And so when I would see that, that anger, that howling rage in my words, uh, it would create this tension between those two parts of the process for me. If you belong to a group that is uh, marginalized uh, in systemic ways, then even when you're writing about something mundane, you know, it could be what you had for breakfast, uh, you start to think about, oh, who made this bread, <laughs> like, who, you know, what is the, 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 the caste dynamic or the gender, to, like who, who runs the company? And, and usually it's going to be a man. So what is his wife doing? And there's all this kind of narrative around it. So you can't just sit down and write about your bloody breakfast. Um, and that's, that's what I refer to as writer's grievance. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's important to say for anybody listening who, who may have similar feelings and those who don't, to, to understand that this is, uh, like going back to what I was saying about feminism bringing joy, um, I would also say that it brings um, truth in that sense. It brings uh, complexity and uh, a kind of dynamic um, approach to even something like breakfast, you know. And if we can do that with even something like breakfast that's so quotidian, then we can apply that same kind of dynamic approach to, um, to much bigger questions. Yeah. Uh, give me a temperature check 
on how you think we're doing with conversations about race. It feels like a lot has changed. And depending on who I read, I feel hopeful that things have changed for the better or I feel despairing that things are going backwards or, you know, that there are many, many threads in this conversation. But certainly it's been it's been top of agendas in a, in uh, in the mainstream, in the public consciousness in a way that it hasn't been um, for the last few years. What's been your kind of journey through that and h- how do you think we're doing? Um, I think that progress has been made, certainly since the, the Black Lives Matter protest of 2020, which, you know, importantly, were not the first Black Lives Matter protest. Um, they, they've been going on for almost a decade. Um, but those ones which happened during the height of the pandemic, you know, they, they for some reason really were catalytic um, for a lot of conversations, which I do think have resulted in, 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 in a lot of changes. I mean, I almost in my world, in the work that I do, um, I've almost started to think uh, about my conversations as a kind of pre-2020 BLM and post-2020 BLM. And also in relation to that, um, it's, it's, it's amusing somehow because, you know, conversations that, that I've been having with, you know, people in my network um, and people, my, my kind of comrades um, for over a decade now um, are conversations that people are now having on a kind of mass scale um, it's not even amusing. It's amazing is a better word. You know, it, it feels, that feels really, really positive because for so long we were like having these conversations and really wanting like people to listen. And all of a sudden in just the space of a few months, it was like, you could have those conversations in any public space and, and people kind of get what you're talking about. Um, so all of that is really positive. I think what is worrying or one of the things that is worrying is, um, well, first of all, the the, the co-opting of a lot of the language um, around racial liberation, um, which, you know, just turns things into uh, commodified, uh, easily palatable um, movements, you know, like words like um, anti-racism. It just starts to, to lose the real kind of revolutionary character of that work. Um, But also, and especially, I think the timing is, um, it was necessary, but it's also unfortunate in so far that everything about our world and our societies right now is on the edge. You know, there's a climate emergency, there's new forms of social media that are creating so much tension. We're losing democracy. Our politicians are increasingly corrupt. There's more and more uh, refugees that are fleeing. You know, there's so many things, um, populism, etc. And so that means that when things happen that are even the most progressive shifts forward are happening in a time in which everybody's on edge. Um, and that means that it can be really difficult to, to conduct conversations in productive ways. Um, So I think we are seeing a lot of uh, polarization because of that, because people might actually be more sympathetic to certain causes, but because they are so threatened by the wider, uh, the the wider happening. Destabilizing moment. Exactly. So it becomes easy to kind of, uh, to, to, to blame it on things that they might otherwise actually see as progressive as well. Interesting. Um, your work is really characterized, your blog, Miss Afropolitan, and, and the book, Sensuous Knowledge, is really grounded in the sense of kind of Black Afrocentric feminism as a gift, as a lens, as a kind of enriching standpoint. Um, one of the words that comes up a lot in that, which some of our listeners will be very familiar with and some of them won't, is intersectionality. So I just wanted to, to do like, you know, Black Feminism 101 and, and get you to, to say a bit about that word and what it means, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Although um, I do not mention 
intersectionality. I don't think once in my book. <laughs> Great. Um, so tell me, tell me why, because if you want to say yeah. I'm not a fan, that's helpful too. It's good to know. <laughs> sure. Um, so, I mean, firstly, I can, I, intersectionality is uh, a theory that was coined by uh, a Black feminist scholar called Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and it is a brilliant uh, theory that she coins, um, which describes the way that Black women's lives are um, limited by multiple forms of oppression. Um, so at the point when she wrote her famous essay in the 1980s, there was still this idea that people were either discriminated uh, because they were Black or because they were women or because they came from the working class. Um, so there was like these single issue uh, analyses of oppression. And what Kimberly Crenshaw theorized was that actually, if you're a Black woman, you are uh, you're experiencing oppression because of your race, your gender, and very often also your class. Um, she wasn't the first person to, to talk about this. And prior to her coining intersectionality, it was called um, multiple jeopardies. Um, there were like... Uh, there's I a like theory. that. Yeah, that's great as well. There's a, a theory called the six mountains on your back, um, which was another way of, of looking at these multiple oppressions. Um, but, but Kimberly Crenshaw certainly like, you know, uh, she consolidates it in a way that then kind of doesn't take off until 20 years later or so in, in the mainstream. Um, and that is why I don't uh, like tend to call myself an intersectional feminist, even though, um, I mean, of course, as a black feminist, I am, I, I, I agree with uh, her arguments. Um, but the way in which intersectionality is understood since it entered the mainstream without the kind of rigorous thinking behind it uh, is, in my view, dangerous. It's, um, you know, it's for one, something that I see a lot of um, institutions, whether it's like corporations or academic institutions, for example, who say that, oh, we are intersectional. And yet they may have like 1% of their staff <laughs> are, are women of color or something. And so it's just so completely co-opted. Um, and I feel like the more that we as Black feminists use that, the more we kind of validate that co-opting. Um, but I, 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 it's not something that I, you know, that I reject or I take issue with. I just don't, don't use the, the, that language myself. That's um, helpful. Yeah. Tell me what sensuous knowledge is. This, this book, it's really lovely actually seeing these multiple identities of you as a poet and as a kind of intellectual and the, the way those threads come together. Tell me what sensuous knowledge is and why you felt you wanted to speak about it. Yeah, um, sensuous knowledge is a, uh, a, a spiritual and a holistic um, approach to knowledge that is rooted in Black feminism. Um, because it is an approach to knowledge that is looking at any given issue in this kind of dynamic way that we've been discussing. So trying to, to understand things holistically, bringing in, um, interweaving, you know, uh, science with art or academia with storytelling, uh, poetic, the poetic with reason, um, because that is how we live as humans be human beings, you know, we have these kind of multiple experiences. Um, so it's really about bringing the realms of lived experience together. Um, and by that, I also mean the more than human natural world. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, I guess, you know, since the phrase came to, to my mind and, and I decided I would title my book that and I would uh, write about sensuous knowledge, it's also uh, still important for me to say that it's, uh, it's an expression that is it, it it doesn't belong to me and it isn't ever fully defined. It's a kind of explorative way of approaching knowledge. And it is that because what it is resisting is the conventional approach to knowledge in our world, which is one in which we try to measure and control and domesticate and sort of we, we turn everything into something robotic and uh, machine-like. Um, that's what so much of our, our epistemic knowledge traditions are about. And so centering the rational and the measurable. Exactly. Um, and so if I were to do the same to sensuous knowledge, that would be in contrast to what it's trying to do. So it isn't something that can be defined or, you know, there's no formula for it. It's something explorative and open. 
I was really thinking as I was reading your book about the difficulty of operating within the world of ideas whilst also trying to broaden the horizons of the world of ideas. And I sometimes, you know, I felt this in various places and lots of people do. I think we have these signifiers of who's smart, who's to be taken seriously. And it depends who you quote, you know, who, what you've read, who you know. And you, one of the phrases from your book that really stood, stood out was black women in the world of ideas feel like intruders. I think possibly women more generally as well. Have you felt that tension of realizing that to help shift the center of gravity of what we think of as valid high status knowledge, you have to sort of play the game of the existing world <laughs> and, and is there conflict and compromise in there? Speak to me a bit about that. I think that uh, I probably myself have um, been able to kind of shape shift more in the past where, you know, you enter a space and it is, it feels intimidating. Um, and, you know, this whole thing about imposter syndrome, for instance, um, is something that resonated with me for a long time, but it no longer does. Um, I now um, find it more important to, to try to not adjust to whatever environment I am in. Um, it's not easy. And, you know, without a doubt, I probably fail sometimes, but that's, that's how I strive to be in the world. And it goes back to that motto of mine that I will live, but that is all I will do for patriarchy. And so I refuse to play the games. Um, and, and since making that kind of decision in my life, um, what I realized was that what we call imposter syndrome is more about, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of cover up because when you're in a, in a, in an environment, um, where you are feeling hostility toward you and it's made clear in sometimes very subtle ways but there's you know people may may ask you questions that they kind of know maybe you won't know about because that's not who you are but it's and, and the intention of that is to put you in your place um, and to describe what comes from that as imposter syndrome is to, to it's a kind of victim blaming somehow and once I realized that it was a real aha moment for me, it's like, no, I'm actually in an environment that is hostile toward me. It is very normal for me to feel intimidated. And, and what I then can choose to do is to either um, respond to that, which is probably what I would have done in the past. But now I, I will just speak my truth as calmly as possible without wanting to be antagonistic, but really, uh, you know, focusing on, on my integrity, because ultimately uh, that's what the... The, the victimization or the, the prejudice is trying to do to you is to make you lose your sense of stability and integrity. Mm, that's helpful. I'm very sad to see that we are coming to the end of our time and I want to finish with one final question, which um, I guess I need to frame by saying, I am very aware that the best selling book on race uh, in the UK has been, why am I no longer talking to white people about race? So I've obviously thought a lot about all the ways, um, kind of my own questions and my behavior and how I can just listen really well. Um, so I'd like to ask particularly about that. You have been very generous with your time today. And I know in lots of settings you are talking across boundaries and wanting to be in a range of spaces with this kind of, this is what a black feminist story perspective posture on the world can bring. You know, it is a gift. We need to understand it. Um, what helps those conversations be productive and a sense of actual human meetings and what harms those situations? I guess for white listeners like me, kind of what can we avoid what can we do better? And um, anything else that you have observed just makes them more likely to be productive and constructive rather than dividing and destructive. So what I'm always wanting to convey, and this comes from uh, a place of compassion. That's why the subtitle of my book is A Black Feminist Approach for Everyone. Um, and it's quite intentional because I think a lot of the literature is, you know, it's either specifically targeting uh, white people or not white people, which ultimately what that does is just center whiteness all the time. Um, and so I want to be expansive and, you know, this is for everyone. Um, but I have had, you know, some readers have come to me and said, 
oh, but you didn't kind of explain in the book why it is for everyone and how it is relevant to white people. Um, and that's precisely the point, you know, like I, um, I read books by white men, by white women, by people from all over the world. I watch films, I listen to the news, whatever. All of the time I am taking in material which isn't specifically telling me how it is relevant to me as a black woman. And this is something that I feel is a kind of, uh, it's a gift perhaps of being somebody who's uh, racialized as black and in a female body is that I can see the humanity of others without having to be asked to see the humanity of others. Um, and so that is what my work wants to say to white people, if anything, because I am speaking to everyone. I don't want to say specific things to white people or to black people. I just want to say my truth and hopefully that can inspire or motivate or just inform people about other ways of seeing the world. Um, but what I would say is, you know, this quality of just, uh, you know, seeing listening to others and not having to be told that that is what is the right thing or the ethical, the progressive thing, to realize for oneself that that is, um, that's what it means to be a human, to see, the, see humanity in others. Mina Salami, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. Thank you so much, Liz. It was a pleasure. Well, as always, lots of thoughts swilling around after that one. One of the groups of people that I sometimes feel most nervous about talking about um, are people that I at least perceive to be activists. And actually, that's a bit of a strange category. And I'm realizing Mina probably wouldn't put herself in the category of activists, possibly. Um, but not just on issues of race and gender, issues of climate. Um, there's another episode in this series with Rupert Reed, who is a philosopher and climate campaigner. Because there's a certain activist energy, which is... In theological terms, we'd call it prophetic, um, kind of pointing out injustice or calling people to a higher standard. But the Old Testament prophets, from where we get that term, were not always easy people to be around. It's quite confronting and quite challenging being called to a higher standard, actually, and often brings up feelings of um, guilt or complicity and then often maybe this is just me some sort of resentment in there because really I don't want to have to think about um all of that this is really being vulnerable now um all of which is to say I often go into conversations with activists not super excited um and as is often the way in those conversations those feelings turn out not to be um just not necessary, that the best voices who are speaking about these deep and painful issues, whether it's climate or race or gender, um, one, they're complicated, fragile human beings like the rest of us. They know, you know, they haven't got it all together either. Um, and they're just passionate and um, urgent, and we really need those voices. Um, yeah, and Mina, Mina's one of those who... Um, I knew her a little bit, so I knew the kind of richness and the complexity of her voice and the things that she's interested in. Um, but, and I said this in the podcast that we did quite a while ago now with Chinny McDonald, there's just conversations about race feel high stakes at the moment. It feels really easy for things to um, get painful and awkward rather than productive. And there's some good reasons for that. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't have them. Um, but yeah, I'm just grateful for the Mina's graciousness and her matter-of-factness also and her, just the sense you have that she's really quite comfortable in her own skin and she's saying what she's saying and she's navigating some of these difficult things um, in what feels like a really healthy way. And given, given what she said about her childhood, it, this beautiful, vivid picture of a kind of Nigerian household compound with generations living together and different people living together and then having to leave that because there's too much violence in your country and travel without one parent to a completely different culture in which you experience racist abuse just can't help have, but have been quite traumatic and very formative. Um, yeah, I just, I heard the pain in that. 
I really liked her, and we didn't get into it too much because I, I didn't want it to get too technical, but she has this um, contrast between what she calls Europatriarchal knowledge, which is very measurement, linear, spreadsheet, high value of rationality, low value on kind of intuition and the senses and the arts um, and sensuous knowledge, which has high value on those alternatives. And I realise there's a huge irony that I'm going to quote a white man here, but it reminded me of Ian McGilchrist, who I quote a lot, and he has a new book out. And his stuff about different hemispheres of the brain um, actually having a different ontology, a different way of understanding the world, of being in the world. And we've created a society that's very left-brained, that's very, um, forms us to value um, linear rationality, measurability, concrete concepts. And so he'd put things like faith and religion and art and creativity um, and intuition into kind of right hemisphere ways of knowing and ways of being in the world. And um, yeah, sensuous knowledge reminded me of that. And finally, her thing about, it's sad that she she had to say a black feminist approach for everyone because um, certain speakers in public conversation don't feel the need to say this is for everyone. They assume it's for everyone. Um, And just that, yeah, this sense of how deep our tribalism goes and how easy it is for us to see each other, usually unconsciously, as not fully human um, and how much attention and intention it takes to be continually challenging that in ourselves and I draw deep on my kind of Christian theological tradition to do that I think it's a very powerful um call to see the image of God the Imago Dei in everyone um but however you go about that practice it again just feels urgent and important today Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Sacred. Remember, sharing is caring, as my four-year-old says, so please do send this or another episode to a friend, rate us on Apple Podcasts, or my personal favourite, leave us a review. I really get a thrill when I see a new one pop up. Huge thanks to Abby Allison for research and production support, and Emily Down for our visual identity. We are edited by Drew Hawley, and our music is composed and arranged by Luke Stanley, with vocals by Lizzie Harvey. The Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos, and you can find out more about our work at theosthinktank.co.uk.